This poem was part of a real argument with a real person. Uh, I was very close to it at the time, and he was the son of the Archdeacon of Lindisfarne. And a bit of a, a bon viveur and a rue and uh, a sort of all over the place. And uh, very much a kind of modern man. And I could not understand why, in the mid-1990s, he was so against the idea of women priests. And eventually I asked him, I said, look, what is the problem about women priests? And he looked at me and he said, blood. Whereupon I got up and left him and went home and wrote this poem. <clears throat> so, blood makes we women unfit to preside over the tabernacle, the altar, the communion sacrament, unfit to speak to the maker of souls, bodies, yea, matter itself. It is blood makes us unfit to be priests in your Catholic Church. It's all down to molecules, atoms, the polychromatic notes on the biochemical scale. God must not be besmirched by the reality that procreates his own universe. Did Christ not bleed on the cross? Did martyrs not die for the blood of the Lamb? Was Abraham not ready, on his whim, knife in hand, to draw blood on the altar, to sacrifice the life of his son, born of woman's blood and the begetting and the birthing, for your ego's sake? This was the man who gave his name to a legacy of compassion, who lived to deliver the tablets from the high mountain, saying that the son should happily forgive the murderous, jealous impulses of the father, who lived to say, honour thy father and thy mother, not in the letting of blood, but in the red glow of understanding. My friend, mock not, nor fear the blood of women shall diminish thy altar. The blood of women is like the cry of the herdsman calling his udder-filled kai home for a kind milking. The blood of women is shed, a black eye, as she laments her man going to a stupid, useless battlefield where the blood of striplings stains the soil with a red undiluted by torrents of tears from heaven, leaving women to bleed monthly with no men to make plants of seed. The blood of women makes possible the worship of the God you claim your own. We do not, cannot claim him as our own. We hope upon a moment he might listen, might know the blood we shed in his name. We cannot help our blood, but offer it as a flower on his altar, as promise that his aura will continue through our pain to light the future dawns and sunsets of this world that we hope he loves. Uh, this is a strange poem. Uh, there is no doubt that I love my mother at least as much as my father. It would be impossible to say which I love more. And I wouldn't say even if I knew. But I did write it after I wrote the elegy for my father, four years later, after he died, I thought, oops, I haven't written one for my mother. So this is a, has a strange, almost hymn-like formality to it. Uh, but the feeling behind it is so true. She did have these eyes that flash so blue. Elegy for my mother. How could I not weep for you, knowing that in your passing the white tide of comfort flowing from you no more would wrap my body in its waves. How could I not grieve for you, knowing that in your ending I must face the everlasting grey of separation from you, a distance that can never be undone? How could I not cry for you, knowing this the final closing of eyes that flashed blue with the awe in you at the world? all its hugeness and its pride. How could I not mourn for you, knowing that in your dying, the red gleam of the love for all around you 
would darken to a smouldered heap of ash. How could I not weep for you, knowing now the meaning, the black reality of never more to see you, knowing it is for myself I weep. Hello, I'm John Plunkett. I was born 40 something years ago in Ireland, um, but I've now lived well over half my life in Scotland, living and writing here in the, in the Highlands. And I'm going to do three poems for you here. Uh, the first one is a poem, it's not so much about lockdown, but it's kind of inspired by the, this kind of feeling of being in lockdown and wanting to look above or beyond it and reconnect with, with other things again. It's titled, An Old Wooden Ladder. I will keep this fragile thing, held together by little more than hope. I will keep it awkwardly propped, each worn rung, a cosmos of wormholes born through from other times, and each one loose in its socket. I will keep it for every leaf clogged gutter, every blown light bulb and painted cornice. I will keep it for every perfect apple that hung just beyond our reach. For every head high wall that blocked a broader view. For every fence we have had to cross. For every good word spoken that fell short of its intention. For every theory not quite grasped. Every fresh idea not yet realised. For every friend who braced themselves with fingers clasped and hands cupped, ready to hold a foot. But mostly as a reminder that regardless of our reach, there are always things that will remain beyond. Always a hairbreadth from our outstretched fingers or countless light years into the mind spin of a universe. I keep it because we reach and reach again. And all the while we cling to this fragile thing held together by little more than hope. The second poem I'm going to do is titled Namer of Storms. You give them human names. Of course you do. Chaos surrounds them. And the simple fact that any one of them can shake our world they can uproot things we thought would never change. We build our walls, batten hatches and bolt our doors. We brace ourselves as they approach, expecting the worst. Let me tell you, namer of storms, if you're ever stuck, just let me know. There are many names I can suggest. The, uh, the final poem I'm going to do is, um, it's, titled And Now the Time is Spilled. And it's another, it's a poem, again, sort of relevant to this time. It's a post-apocalyptic poem, but it looks to a time, yeah, when I suppose the earth and everything around us is beginning to heal again, and that we, uh, well, fingers crossed, have learned from some of our mistakes. And now the time is spilled. Now that time has spilled into a new age, we can start again. We can clear space in the woods and let light fall among the trees. We can plough fresh fields and dot each furrow with seed. We can harvest and store, build homes and halls and season wood and set peat to the wind. We can light fires beneath our stills and fill our streets with stories and songs while the land shapes who we are. We can mark our days, see them roll into seasons. Years will pass as we raise our crops and raise our livestock and weather countless storms. We can weave and wash our clothes, build bridges across every boundary, hang unlocked gates in every hedgerow, and we can raise no flag, no flag, no declaration of difference. 
We will darken no skies with the colours of division because we know that others will come as we once did. I'm Annie Wright and I live very close to these woods here. Um, they're a favourite place to walk and this particular tree, this oak, is one of my favourite places to just come and sit. I wrote the following two poems during this last year of lockdown when, like so many people, I found myself observing things in nature, in the garden, that perhaps I wouldn't have noticed at other times. And the first poem is called Jay. When I lived in the woods, I'd hear the screeching, raucous ah hawing before I caught sight of a pinky beige blur, white rump, jet tail, against a scree of oak above Colden's cleft, brightening the early dash for the bus stop at the valley bottom. Rare woodland sight. So what a delight to see sparrows and tits flit from the feeders and you swoop in, garrulous as ever, on the peanut cage, warning the small fry. Electric blue weave of ribbon through black flight feathers, just feet from the kitchen window, lights a drab morning. And the second poem I'm going to read is called Little Egrets and it comes from taking a walk down at Calaverock on the um, wetlands. Um, and the poems inspired by the little egrets that we saw there that day, which by now are becoming a commoner sight in Britain on the wetlands. We see them in Cumbria, we've got them in the west of Scotland. But years ago, of course, they, were a very, they would have been a very, very uncommon sight. Little Egrets Indian summer afternoon on the salt marsh at Calaverock. Common data dragonflies are brilliant flashes of cardinal red, transparent shimmer of wings. Flushes of crimson haws and scarlet hips cluster thickly on tree and hedge. The blue-black shadow of sloes is ripe with the promise of winter and ruby gin. But my eye is drawn out across the wetlands to where a white flag hangs idle amongst reeds and grasses. Beyond, in the liminal lands, another and, right on the margin of land and sea, a third stands, stiff as a laundered handkerchief. Memories surface, crest like foam, on an almost motionless sea. Our dad, in 1962, newly promoted to a better job in Guildford that meant a long commute by bus and train from Fetcham. All summer long, his three daughters rushed to the garden fence to wave at his train pass through the cutting below. He'd hang a white hanky out of the window his little token of love. It was the cruelest winter, everyone and everything covered in padded jackets, numb as patients in asylums. Milk froze on the step, had to be excavated. Chilblains burned our toes. Dad arrived home later and later. Trains cancelled, lines needed clearing. At Effingham Junction, a stove in the waiting room was lit, but barely thawed Arctic commuters. The Crombie coat couldn't warm him. White hankies shaken out mopped the constant coughs, colds and bad chest. Mum, as ever, found a solution. One morning he called us into their bedroom to see him prance in woollen all-in-ones Button through long johns and vest, arms and legs stick thin as a heron. In the littoral zone, another waits, 
spreads a blank page of wing. I think of the only time we met, your late night calls, and how when you should have flown in from an exotic shore, illness prevented it, the reading cancelled. Years on, hearing you died, I wept, shook out a handkerchief, a little white egret of regret.